Hi everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining Foley and Lardner for today's presentation. Before we get started on today's program, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. If you are not speaking, kindly mute your, mute your microphone and turn off your camera. If you have any questions about today's topics, we invite you to enter them in the meeting chat, which is located in the toolbar on the top right hand side of your screen. If you experience any technical difficulties, please refresh your browser or leave the meeting and rejoin. If you continue to have issues, please email videoconferencing at foley.com. Please note that today's presentation is being recorded. And now I will turn it over to John Birmingham to begin today's program. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, with the OSHA ETS program. We're thrilled with the number of people who have signed up for this uh, webinar. I think it's a, a testament to the uh, uniqueness and complexity of the OSHA standard and the compliance challenges that you all are facing. I want to just do a real quick overview and then we'll kind of get right into it. So the overview on how we got here on September 9, 2021, uh, President Biden, frustrated with the vaccine vaccination rate, announced that OSHA would issue an emergency rule requiring either vaccination or weekly testing. The clear goal was to increase the number of people who are vaccinated. So on November 5th, we had to wait a little while, right? But on November 5th, OSHA issued the emergency temporary standard requiring either vaccination or weekly testing. It's about 500 pages long. Um, I give everybody credit here if you read the whole thing. <clears throat> but regardless of the policy arguments on both sides, it clearly is a breathtaking exercise of federal power. And it comes at a time, uh, which I think a lot of people on, on this phone call uh, would recognize. It comes at a time of a labor shortage uh, and a supply chain crisis. So some of the logistical and practical challenges like the testing option uh, that I think the labor shortage will cause many of you to uh, accept will test the people on this webinar. And so we're here to help and we're here to, to help navigate through, through this process. So let me talk a little bit about whether or not we're relieved of uh, of these regulations and whether it's all over before it begins. OK, so the day after the ETS was issued, the United States Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals issued a stay of the ETS uh, and the stay was very short and sweet. It was based upon the conclusion that there were grave constitutional and statutory issues with the mandate. Typically, when a court of appeals issues a stay, acknowledged as, as, as common knowledge, uh, this was a nationwide stay. So as of right now, the Fifth Circuit stay of the ETS is in effect, okay? Um, almost immediately after, on uh, this Monday, uh, the Department of Justice asked the Fifth Circuit to lift the stay, but it has not done so, and I don't think we can expect that it will do so. So what happens? Um, what happens with respect to the stay, right? So it wasn't just in the Fifth Circuit, but there were 26 other states, many businesses and now unions which have filed separate court actions. Um, and the circuits now involved are the Sixth Circuit, the Seventh Circuit, the Eighth Circuit, the Eleventh Circuit, the DC Circuit. Those were the initial filings in all those circuits. So this got a lot of attention. Uh, there were there was a lot of legal maneuvering right off the bat. And then just today, unions um, have filed actions uh, in the quote unquote more liberal circuits, the Ninth Circuit, the Fourth Circuit, and the Second Circuit. So all those circuits now have legal actions filed there. Why is that important? And why is it that um, unions uh, filed in the other circuits just today? Because what's ultimately going to decide which circuit decides this case is a lottery. 
OK, so on November 16, uh, just a few days from now, all of these circuits will essentially be put in a hat in a lottery. Everybody will get an equal chance of getting the case. And the circuit that's chosen through the lottery then will take control of the case. In the old days, there was a race to the courthouse, right? So the Fifth Circuit would have been the circuit that decided the case. Now it's going to be decided by this lottery. So why does that matter? Well, if you're interested kind of in legal realism, um, if you look at some of the circuits, like the Eighth Circuit has uh, judges that were all appointed by uh, Republicans except one judge, whereas the Ninth Circuit is a very, is generally regarded as a very liberal circuit. So the ultimate decision about whether the state continues, whether the ETS is upheld or invalidated may very well depend upon where it goes in this lottery. OK, so that's kind of the legal realism part of it. But, you know, there's there's also there's also obviously other parts, right? Who's going to who's going to win this? Now, OSHA spent about 250 pages uh, with its legal justification in the ETS. So they put a lot of work, a lot of time into it. They knew that it was going to be challenged and, and they did everything they could, I think, to try to uh, provide support to oppose the challenge. Right. And I think, you know, generally among lawyers, the conventional wisdom was before uh, before the uh, the ETS was issued that OSHA did have the authority to, to do it. But if you look at the history, uh, th this has ha not happened much at all. It's only been issued, the, an ETS, an emergency temporary standard, has only been issued nine times uh, since OSHA has been in existence. Out of those nine times, six times it was challenged in court. And out of those six challenges, OSHA or the Department of Justice, which argues the case, only won one time. OK, so they have a one in five record historically. Now, that's better than the, the Detroit Lions, uh, but not much better. So you know, the, the history is not on OSHA's side. If you look at the arguments, and we certainly don't have nearly enough time to go through the, argu the arguments, but the arguments but essentially are, you know, that you know, do we really have a grave danger at this point in time, right? Maybe we had a grave danger with respect to COVID before. Do we have a grave danger now? Um, do we, is there a grave danger to, to people who are vaccinated? Um, does, it, does it make sense right now? Is, is there such a grave danger that uh, the emergency temporary standard is justified. Um, you know, there's also arguments that it's not necessary to prevent the grave danger, that the standard is too broad or too ambiguous or it's not necessary. There's the argument that COVID is not a workplace hazard and therefore OSHA shouldn't even be involved in it. And then there's the arguments about, you know, the states reserve the police power and you know federalism arguments and OSHA overstepped their bounds with respect to everything. So so it's going to be very fascinating how this is all going to work out. You might want to put on your calendars if you're hoping and praying that that the uh, ETS standard gets invalidated and the stay remains. Put on your calendars uh, November 16th because whatever court gets that uh, gets gets the case at that point in time can basically. Uh, lift the stay that the Fifth Circuit uh, put in place and do what it wants with the case from from there on out. So uh, or, or they can uh, enforce it. You're going to see, by the way, a lot of activity in the Fifth Circuit between now and November 16th because legal momentum picks up. And the more that's that's kind of issued or the more activity that occurs, it, it, it could potentially have an effect no matter which state it, it goes to. Having said all that, since we're giving a webinar on the OSHA ETS standard, we really think it's it's very important to prepare, prepare. Okay? prepare in advance because you're not going to be relieved of the timeline based upon the decisions of, of the court. If the court invalidates it completely, then you will. But you could get a ruling the day before um, the the uh, ETS has to go in effect and you need to be prepared for that. So we are strongly encouraging clients to keep moving forward keep preparing, don't count on the ETS being invalidated. Uh, and that's that's part of the reason why we're here today. So having said that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jeff Kopp, who's gonna talk about coverage issues. 
Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jeff Kopp. I'm a partner here in the Detroit office. Um, I'm going to talk about the coverage, and let me start with the threshold. Um, most of you on the call are with big companies that are over 100 employees, so you probably don't even really have to focus too much, but uh, we are getting a lot of questions about who's included, right? And so uh, when you count 100 employees, you look at all U.S. employees at all U.S. locations, regardless of their vaccination status, we're counting at the company or the employer level, not at individual locations of your businesses. Uh, remote workers who work at home count in the 100, 100 employee threshold. Um, what doesn't count is employees who are provided through staffing agencies. Uh, those employees are counted generally under their, the own, their, that staffing company. Uh, temporary or seasonal employees will count in your 100. Um, and in terms of franchisees, franchises, only the franchisees employees will count towards that particular franchise calculation. Um, for multi-employer work sites, only employees of that employer, of each employer, will count towards their 100 threshold. And minors and part-time employees also count in the 100 threshold. Um, those are pretty straightforward, but what we're really getting questions about is related companies or subsidiaries. Um, and the test that OSHA adopted in the ETS is whether or not there's a common or integrated safety person or safety coordinator for all of the companies. So you could have situations where you have many people that work on safety issues for the company. And if that's true, if they're integrated, then it's likely that OSHA would take the position that those related entities are considered as one integrated company for purposes of the ETS. Um, this is a little bit different than maybe some of the other situations where um, governmental agencies look to see whether there are joint employers based on other common factors that might um, be existent, such as common control or common officers or common HR or legal. Um, OSHA really didn't go into it, but I, I suspect that those additional tests may be considered as well when you're looking at integration issues. Um, and I think ultimately it may be a case by case determination as to um, whether or not companies really are considered one for the threshold coverage issue. Union employees, um, employee employers that had union workplaces um, with 100 or more employees, you're also going to be covered um, the same as you would if your employers employees were not um, union employees. However, um, nothing, as OSHA points out, nothing in the ETS prevents employers from agreeing with employees or the unions to implement additional measures, things that might be uh, such as uh, wearing face masks, even though they may not be required when people are vaccinated. All of those things may have to be bargained. Uh, the costs of testing, I know Carrie will talk about that later, uh, but um, that's another thing that that um, union employees may um, may come up in a union environment. So when you're looking at coverage issues, the benchmark date was when the effective date of the standard was issued, which is November 5th. And so um, so if you've ha if you have 100 or more employees as of November 5th, you're covered and the ETS applies for six months, right? It's a, it's a six month emergency temporary standard. And so if the employer is below the threshold, let's say you have 95 employees, but then you hire 10 additional employees at any time during the six month period, then you will effectively become covered by the ETS. And once an employer is covered, so if you have 100 employees or more today, and let's say you have a, a layoff that takes you below 100, well, you're covered for the duration of the ETS as well. There are particular exemptions from from coverage so and, and there are really two one is if you are an employer that's covered by the safer workforce task force covid workforce safety guidance for federal contractors so um, and i took although i took this language directly from the frequently asked questions it's not really accurate uh o osha meant to say that ets does not apply to federal contractor workplaces that are covered by the by the workforce guidance. And so what that means is if you're a federal contractor, you may have locations where you have employees that are performing work on the federal contract or people that are in contact with those people, but you have other locations like perhaps your headquarters or other locations where, where people are not working on the federal contract 
and those people would be covered by the OSHA ETS guidance. So you do have to comply with the ETS guidance in locations where the federal contract work is not being performed. Um, also, the ETS exempts healthcare locations that are covered under the, the uh, provisions of 29 CFR 1910.502. Um, and so you could read that language there, but basically if you're a federal contractor and you have um, healthcare uh, workers or employees that are providing patient care, then you, you want to look closely at these exemptions because you, you may not be totally covered under the OTS, uh, ETS from OSHA. Also, the ETS has coverage as to certain employees and exemptions as to certain employees. So um, the requirements don't apply to, to people who work in a workplace where they're by themselves or there are no other coworkers or customers are present or if those employees are working from home exclusively, or if they're exclusively working outdoors. And so OSHA has looked, it provided some guidance with respect to outdoor employees, and they've said that really, if, if people are maybe in a landscaping setting or construction or outdoor oil drilling or whatever, um, if, if they're working exclusively outdoors, and that means that they don't even share vehicle space with people, or they're not sitting in vehicles together, um, or if they're um, they're able to, they're not eating together and sitting together during a lunch. Uh, there may be some de minimis uh, situations where somebody uses a bathroom or the, the time spent indoors is brief, but otherwise um, the, the people are going to have to be exclusively outdoors in order to not have to be um, covered by the OSHA ETS. So, um, so that's pretty much the coverage issues. I'm going to turn it over to Carrie, who will get into more of the requirements of the ETS at this time. So um, what do we have to do? The requirements of the ETS say that we have to vaccinate for weekly tests. So you can choose to mandate vaccination. I understand from many clients that that's not necessarily the choice we all want to make. Or we can allow employees to test weekly um, if they're not able or willing to be vaccinated. We can have different policies for different segments of the workforce. So by way of example, in the uh, presentation I'm talking about, um, employees who interact with customers, we might have a mandatory vaccination policy for where office employees, we might do the opposite, or you could flip that. I do understand for employers with hourly workers, um, this issue has become very important and very focused, meaning we don't want to um, force them to test because we don't think they're vaccinated, excuse me, because we don't think they're going to come. The other big requirement of the ETS is that we have to develop, implement, and enforce a written COVID vaccination policy, meaning whatever that policy is that you all are deciding, vaccinate um, everybody or vaccinate or weekly test, you need a written policy that you have in place so that the employees um, know what that policy is and if OSHA came calling, you could provide it to them. Um, next, we have to, as employers, obtain proof of vaccination status, meaning if the employee tells you I've been vaccinated, I don't need to be tested weekly, we don't get to take them at their word. Um, we need either a record of immunization from a healthcare provider, a copy of that vaccination card that now looks like a lottery ticket because it's so important to get you into many places, some medical record showing vaccination status, and if the employee can't provide any of them, we need we can take a written signed dated statement from the employee that says they've been vaccinated with what vaccine, what dates, et cetera. But I, again, last resort, big picture, they should be able to provide you some proof of vaccination. You don't have to see their physical card. A picture of it should be sufficient, um, but you wanna make sure it looks genuine when you're looking at it. Um, again, an employee can attest to their vaccination status, fully or partially vaccinated. Um, if they've lost their vaccination card, they need to provide that verification that says my statement about my vaccination status is true and accurate. I understand that if I'm lying, I'm going to be uh, subjected to criminal penalties and they need to tell you what vaccine they received and when they received it. Those are important issues um, if you're going to take a verification as opposed to allowing the employee to test weekly. Uh, the other thing that ETS requires employers to do is provide time for employees to be vaccinated. They're entitled to up to four hours of paid time off to receive their vaccination. So theoretically, if they're getting a two-dose shot, two hours for each shot, 
um, and you cannot take that out of their available PTO or vacation bank. This is separate and apart from anything that you are already providing to them if they're being vaccinated during regular hours. If I choose to do it during off hours, then I'm not obligated as the employer to pay the employee. Uh, but if they're doing it during a work day, because that's what's convenient for them, then we need to provide them the time off. Um, and then we have to provide time off for recovery. Uh, if someone gets a shot and has symptoms following that shot, we can we have to provide them reasonable paid time off, generally up to two days for that recovery. We can require them to use their available sick leave for that, um, which is different from the vaccination. So again, big picture, we have to be able to provide that time off. And then um, if the employee won't, cannot or will not attest to their vaccination status, we have to treat them as unvaccinated. And we're going to get into that. Um, but the other obligation about vaccination status is that we're supposed to maintain a roster of vaccination status of the employees. So we need to know who's been vaccinated, when they've been vaccinated, um, and be able to provide that list to OSHA if they come knocking on the door. Um, they, we do have to treat that information as confidential, meaning whatever document we create, Excel spreadsheet that lists status needs to be maintained as confidential medical information and only the company company employees who have a need to know need to know about it. Then if we're not vaccinated and we're allowing we're not mandating because we're not required to under the OSHA ETS, then we have to do weekly testing for employees who report to work sites where others are present. So Jeff went through the exclusively outdoors, exclusively remote workers. Those people don't have to test weekly, but everybody else who comes in contact with other people as part of their job has to show a negative test result once every seven days. Um, and if they cannot, they cannot be present at the work location. Um, we're not generally obligated to pay for that weekly testing, and we are going to get into more detail on that. Uh, but big picture, we're not generally obligated to pay for testing. Uh, we need to maintain, again, those testing records as confidential medical records, but we're going to have to maintain them however it is you choose to do that, meaning if they upload it to a secure site, um, et cetera. And then employees who haven't been vaccinated and are testing weekly will be required to wear masks. Um, so we can have different policies, at least under the OSHA ETS, about mask wearing in the work site, meaning only those employees who haven't been vaccinated will be required to wear masks. Of course, you can be more severe about it and require everyone to wear masks to avoid the issue. So unvaccinated employees must wear masks whenever they're indoors, unless they're alone in a closed room, unless they have briefly removed it to eat and drink, unless they uh, are briefly remote, like remove it, excuse me, to prove their identity, and unless they're wearing a respirator or face mask. So otherwise they have no excuse, they have to be wearing a mask. Um, it has to cover their mouth and nose. As a person who was on an airplane for a client on Monday, that's a real rough go for the flight attendants. Everyone's reminded regularly to put it above their mouth and nose. Um, and you have to allow vaccinated employees to wear it at their option. Um, we're not required to pay for masks as employers. We can just mandate that employees wear them. Again, depending on the nature of your workforce, you may want to provide masks because employees often, quote, leave them at home. Um, and then they won't be able to work. So you may want to have masks available to employees in the instance that they forget. And then for an employee who tests positive, um, all employees who test positive when they've done their weekly test have to provide you a copy of those test results. And they must be removed from the workforce until they meet one of these three criteria. They have a negative test result. They meet the return to work criteria in the CDC's isolation guidance or they're released to return to work. So again, I know we've referenced football before, but Aaron Rodgers has to test negative by Saturday to be able to be back on the field on Sunday. That's one of those issues um, that you're going to have to then be cognizant of, which is that the employee who tests positive can't come back to work in person until they've tested negative or meet the return to work criteria or get a healthcare provider released to return to work. What are my reporting obligations to OSHA? Do I have to report every time someone tests positive? No, OSHA is not interested in that level of detail. We're going to have to report COVID related fatalities within eight hours of the fatality. Same thing we do with any other workplace death incident. 
and we have to report COVID related hospitalizations within 24 hours of learning of the hospitalization. So again, from those perspectives, we're just following general OSHA reporting rules. And then what kind of records do we have to keep? Um, I have to have COVID related documentation, both vaccine and testing, um, and I have to be able to provide them to OSHA within one business day of when they request them. So I need to have those things available because I don't have a lot of time to gather them. Um, and I have to be able to provide them within four hours of a request, a copy of my COVID-19 policy. So to the extent, again, we've talked about whether this issue gets bumped by courts. Right now we're looking at a November 5th deadline and we need to be in compliance and be able to provide a copy of our COVID policy to OSHA if they ask within four hours. And then compliance. Um, <clears throat> this should be uh, all uh, by December 5th. We need to have all of our vaccination weekly testing records um, in place. So again, that's why we're not waiting for OSHA or for the courts to play out. We need to have a process in place because between now and, th and December 5th isn't very long. And then by January 4th, we have to be fully compliant, both with fully vaccinated or weekly testing by the state. And I think I'm turning it over to Jeff. I think I'm going to take over here, um, Carrie. Um, so so everybody, you may have thought that with the government mandate, you could avoid all the tricky accommodation questions um, and accommodation challenges that have arisen, but unfortunately, uh, not not so fast. Um, the the accommodation uh, challenges still still remain. So, um, OSHA. So basically. Um, on the accommodation questions, we've got a kind of a conundrum, right? So the ETS encourages mandat a mandatory vaccine program, but it clearly provides that somebody with a disability or somebody with uh, a religious objection is entitled to a reasonable accommodation. And we'll kind of get into what that means uh, as, as we move forward. And if you think about it, you know, OSHA, is very, very much focused on encouraging people to get vaccinated. And so if you read the regulations, that's where their focus is, right? You don't have to pay for testing. Um, you know, in some ways it, it, it gives the employer, uh, you know, ammunition to essentially, you know, push a hard line. But on the other hand, the EEOC is set up so that uh, people are encouraged to take accommodations and people are protected for requesting reasonable accommodation. So it's a conundrum that that needs to be needs to be addressed. So it's interesting OSHA if you if you read I'm just probably like on page uh, 422 of the 500 pages OSHA estimates that about 5% of all covered employees will receive religious or medical accommodations or exemptions. I really think that that understates the percentage for a couple of different reasons. First, I think in, you know, in industries where a mandatory vaccination program or a harder line uh, would have been successful with the labor shortage, companies have already instituted those, right? So the, the uh, industries and the companies that this ETS standard is gonna apply to may be instances where there is a labor shortage and people are very resistant um, to either being vaccinated or, or uh, you know, really complying with, with some of the other requirements too. I have some clients, you know, in the automotive industry, for example, in certain states where the percentage of people who voluntarily were vaccinated is somewhere around 25 or 30 percent. So if you've got a plant that has a thousand employees, you're talking about uh, you know, 700 people who may be uh, unvaccinated, right? So I think we can expect that there will be many requests for accommodations um, moving forward under this ETS once it gets implemented. And so it's very, very important that you uh, have good policies and procedures to to take care of it. By the way, um, you know, we all notice there are a lot of questions that are, are being asked 
and we are trying to save some time at the end to answer the questions. I, I think it'd be nearly impossible to get to all the questions given the complexity and the interest, but we're going to we're going to try to be able to answer some of the questions at the end. So there are two basic accommodation areas, right? So accommodation regarding the vaccine mandate. So if if you decide that you're going to mandate the vaccine, you're not going to have the testing option. What do you have to do in terms of a reasonable accommodation? And then there's also the accommodation regarding the testing and mask option. So let's say that you uh, give the option. If you, okay, you say to your employees, you don't have to be vaccinated. You have the testing and mask option. The uh, the ETS and the EEOC still says you need to reasonably accommodate people, even with respect to the testing and mask option. Even though, as I'll get to perhaps uh, there, there might not be a lot there. So I'm not going to dwell on, on the accommodations too much because you have all been through this and it's my guess uh, that, uh, that you know, you, you know, you, you know what you're doing with respect to the accommodations, but I do think this will take it to a new level um, because I, I think there are going to be many, many people who, who, uh, you know, push back and ask for an accommodation. And we'll talk about the religious accommodations in a minute because I, I think that's gonna be an area we get a lot of, right? But I, but this group, I think to the extent that you want to uh, push a policy and you want to have a mandatory vaccination policy, uh, you're gonna have to push back harder or be prepared to push back harder, right? Because you are going to receive many more requests from people saying that they have a disability that prevents them from getting the vaccine. And you're gonna have to have a very good process to handle those requests, to assess those requests, to decide, you know, what do you wanna do? Or I have to say this just as a matter of reality, I think there will be some employers because of the labor shortage, um, because of the difficulty in keeping good employees, that they will take a fairly lenient approach with respect to the accommodation process and not require that much in order to accommodate uh, employees because they're concerned about the ability to hire uh, employees, keep the operation moving forward. So, so it'll it's it's interesting and and the employer typically, I, I mean, you have to act in good faith, obviously, but the accommodation process is left in the hands of the, the employer. So you do have some, some latitude uh, with respect to that. Okay, so the, the bottom line with respect to the ADA accommodations is if somebody comes in and says that they have a disability that prevents them from getting a vaccine, and we're talking about the mandatory vaccine at this point, you have to consider alternatives. You have to look at, okay, how can we accommodate the person? Um, and you have to consider that, those accommodations uh, those accommodations, unless the employee poses a direct threat after the accommodations to the health and safety of the employee and others in the workplace, right? So, what we need to do is we've got to we've got to look at the next steps, and a lot of this is is the interactive accommodation process that you're all used to, and the obvious accommodation with respect to an employer that institutes a mandatory vaccination program is the testing and masking option, right? Because the ETS gives us that as that's an alternative. Um, one question that you may be thinking of though is, okay, let's say we institute a mandatory vaccination program. Um, who pays for it if the employee says, um, I want to be accommodated and the accommodation is the testing and masking option. So typically the employer pays for reasonable accommodations, right? So the EEOC process would be that if somebody comes in and you decide that the accommodation is, okay, we're not going to make you get vaccinated because of your medical condition, but you're going to have to be tested every week and you're going to have to wear a mask. Um, the, the, the EEOC would typically say that is the, uh, the obligation of the employer to pay for it, right? Now, the ETS, of course, says that the employer doesn't have to pay for the testing option. But it also says, unless the collective bargaining agreement or some other law um, obligates the employer to do it. So in the, in the situation of a mandatory um, vaccination system, if somebody asks for an accommodation and you provide them with the testing option, you are going to have to provide, um, you're gonna have to pay for the testing option unless you can prove that it creates an undue hardship. That's a really fascinating question, right? 
because I think with respect to disabilities, um, it's still going to be difficult for the employer to say, listen, uh, it's an undue hardship for us to pay for the testing because we have so many requests. I, I'm not saying, though, that it's it's impossible. I mean, I think there might be an argument, even with respect to disabilities, that it could create an undue hardship if there are so many people who are requesting it um, that that they could you could potentially make that argument much harder with a disability. When we get to the original religious accommodations, though, I think that argument, the undue hardship argument, um, becomes uh, much stronger. One thing I think that this group will have to be prepared to deal with is remote work, right? So, you know, people like remote work. They have, they have, uh, a lot of people have preferred to work remotely during the pandemic, and remote work has worked in a lot of situations during the pandemic, right? So, you're going to be have, have to be prepared for people who um, submit either religious or disability accommodation requests, and their, their accommodation request is, Oh, I would like to go back to working remotely. I, I can't get vaccinated because of my disability or I have a religious objection to the vaccination. So I want to uh, go back to working um, remotely. And that's something that you have to consider, right? The EEOC is kind of cute about this. They issued a, a part of their technical guidance says, well, wait a minute here, just because you've uh, given remote work as an accommodation, that doesn't mean that it would be a reasonable accommodation in all situations. But at the same time, they filed uh, a, a complaint in Georgia essentially saying, OK, um, you know, not providing remote work violated the employer's reasonable accommodation obligation. So. Um, I think I think you're going to have to be prepared to argue or or to say, OK, it might have been uh, it might have worked before the remote work, but it doesn't work now. But the other thing that I think that you'll have to you'll focus on is remember an employee is not entitled to their preferred accommodation, right? So if it would be equally effective to have the person who says my disability prevents me from being vaccinated to have the person come into work and wear a mask, um, and get tested every week, the employee does not get to decide that I prefer remote work to that. So you're going to have, there's going to be issues there, right, where people will ask for remote work, and there may be times when you when you say, I will give you an accommodation, but the accommodation is coming into uh, work, wearing a mask, and getting tested every week. The ADA direct threat, I won't spend too much time on this, but you could also take the position uh, that if you cannot be vaccinated, you present a direct threat to other employees and customers, right? The fact that, and the ETS kind of cuts both ways on that, right? The fact that the ETS gives the testing um, and mask option does signify that you can't say in all cases, someone who's not vaccinated presents a direct threat to employees, customers across the board, right? But I do think in certain industries, um, you, you can consider taking the position that, hey, the ETS says this is a grave danger, and because um, the circumstances make it so that it's not feasible to do social distancing, it's not feasible to wear a mask at all times, it's not feasible maybe to do the testing option that uh, that that uh, it, the person presents a direct threat to, to the workplace. You've got to really look, though, at the components of the job. I mean, maybe uh, working in a crowded sports arena or, or or something like that could potentially qualify, right? But this is a situation where uh, we, we need to look at the direct threat uh, on a case-by-case case case basis. So religious accommodation, so at the same time that the essentially the same time the ETS came out, the EEOC came out with uh, guidance on religious accommodations. And part of that is I really expect that there is going to be uh, a ton of religious accommodation requests that people on this phone call are going to have to handle, right? From people who don't want to be vaccinated uh, and, and potentially don't want to do the testing. In the Fifth Circuit, a religious group just filed, or two religious groups just filed a motion basically saying that the ETS should be invalidated because it's against their religious uh, precepts to uh, to not only be vaccinated but also to be tested every week, right? Uh, so I mean, so that's going to be a hot issue. The, what the technical guidance basically says is uh, if somebody has a sincerely held religious belief 
they they at least we have to go through the accommodation process but a sincerely held religious belief doesn't protect social political or economic views now we already kind of knew that they're emphasizing that again and it's oftentimes very tough to kind of distinguish between the two and the uh maybe more significantly the eeoc said listen if the employer demonstrates an undue hardship then they're not uh potentially uh they don't have to accommodate uh, the, uh, the the person from a religious objection. The religious accommodation issue is really uh, kind of fascinating, right? It's, um, it's traditionally, right, Jeff and Carrie and I, we have not, uh, we've basically counseled uh, clients, listen, it's very, very hard to challenge the sincerity of somebody's religious belief. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an uphill battle. The EEOC has essentially said, you know, listen, you shouldn't do that in the vast majority of cases. You need to take the person uh, at his or her word. Uh, and, and that it's a matter of individual conviction. So you can't say things like, well, you say you're Catholic, but the Catholic Church supports vaccination. So how can that be possible, et cetera? So that's been the traditional approach, right? But I think, especially with the ETS, especially with OSHA's uh, approach, if an employer wants to take a hard line with respect to religious accommodations, I, I think that the courts and the EEOC and OSHA are going to give the employer a significant amount of latitude in, in doing that, right? Um, I, I think that you're going to get requests from people saying, I object to the mandatory vaccination because of my religion. I object to the testing because of my religion. And you're, I, I think you're going to have to have a, a process in place um, where, where you actually uh, challenge or at least make it difficult for somebody to, um, and by difficult, I don't mean, you know, unnecessarily so, but you make the person, you know, justify their accommodation request and that you make them go through the interactive process with respect to the religious accommodation. Because if you don't and you just accept all of them, you're going to get a, a groundswell of accommodation requests. And one thing I think that's really fascinating, and this goes back to you know, what I said with respect to the disability accommodations is typically if an accommodation is granted, the employer has the obligation to pay for it, right? So you could have a situation where um, people come to you and they say, okay, I don't, uh, I don't want to get vaccinated because of my religion and I want you to pay for the testing, right? Even though you don't pay for the testing for other people, um, who aren't being legally accommodated, but you pay for the testing and um, and and that's part of my accommodation requests. Uh, that will be an interesting issue. I think that unlike in the ADA situation, if you get enough requests, right, that it's disrupting operations or it's going to result in, you know, a massive expenditure for testing, it might be, it may be, and this will probably work itself out in the courts, but it may be um, an undue burden to to pay for the tests, right? Uh, I think the courts will look at the testing burden. They'll look at, okay, you know, um, how, how much is it shutting down um, a supplier's ability to supply their customer? Are so many people request, requesting a religious accommodation that paying for it is going to create an undue hardship? Remember, the bar for the undue hardship part for a religious accommodation is, is really a de minimis bar, whereas the ADA accommodation, you really have to prove a lot more in order to show it's an undue hardship. So I, I do think there may be situations where companies will take the position that it is an undue hardship for us to pay for pay for the testing or potentially even to provide for the testing for religious accommodations. It's going to be again, it's going to you have to be flexible. It's going to be on a case by case basis, um, but it's but it's something that you need to, to look at. By the way, a uh, small plug for Foley. We do have um, forms that we've used with clients. If you want to push back with respect to an ADA accommodation request or you want to push back with respect to a religious accommodation request, um, we have some forms that you can use to, uh, you know, uh, make the employee make his or her case and to, and then to assess it. Last thing I'll just talk about real briefly on the religious accommodation. So, you know, just when you thought, okay, uh, now I've got to accommodate the uh, the vaccination 
um, you know, mandate. I've got to I've got to look at whether or not I can require everybody to do it and religious objections and disability objections to that. Um, you also the ETS is clear that if somebody comes to you and they say, listen, I also have an accommodation request with respect to the testing or mask option. You need to look at that, too. OK, um, it's very specific that that's one of the things you also have to look at. So um, I, I do think that this would be this would be an uphill battle because there could be a situation where I mean, the, the ETS basically says it's a grave danger. Right. And so it, it says you either have to be vaccinated or testing in mass. So if the person can't work remotely, OK, it doesn't leave the employer a lot of options in terms of accommodating somebody who has a religious objection to the testing and mask option. And so there may be situations where you have to uh, suspend the person or maybe even terminate the person because there aren't options available out there. Although I will say, uh, you know, just just briefly that the ETS went out of its way to not say anywhere that anybody has to be terminated as part of this process. Takeaways quickly. I think you, first of all, you need to decide um, the level of scrutiny that you're going to look at. And part of that is depends on the labor shortage. Uh, you're gonna have to decide the amount of risk that you that you're that you're willing to take, your risk tolerance, right? It's important, I think, in these situations to try your best to centralize the accommodation process. I know the HR professionals on this call are stretched beyond their limits already, but this is something that it makes sense to have somebody in charge of both with respect to consistency and with respect to how complicated it is. Be prepared to uh, engage in the interactive accommodation process. Use your processes, have processes in place. Be ready if somebody comes to you and says, I have a, a disability accommodation request or I have a religious accommodation request. You should have forms, you should have a process. You, should, you shouldn't just do it haphazard because you're gonna get this. You gotta keep track of the accommodations that are offered. Um, that's part of the uh, ETS and uh, Carrie mentioned this earlier. Keep track or remember your confidentiality obligations. Even the vaccination status of people is on a need to know basis. So it could potentially be dangerous to have, you know, supervisors throughout the plant know everybody's vaccination status. I mean, there, there is a confidentiality um, requirement there. So I'll turn it over to Jeff to kind of to finish up. All right. All right. Thanks. And um, so. Um, before I talk about next steps and really what what you have to do by December 5th, according to the ETS, uh, I'll get into that. But there were a couple of questions about some of the things that I said earlier about um, staffed employees or independent contractors. And I, I just want to be clear. So those kinds of people, staffed employees are not counted for your 100 employee threshold number if they work for their own company. There's the staffing company will consider those people as employees of their that staffing company. But having said that, those people are working and temps are working in your plants and in your workforces alongside your people. So you as the employer could make the decision as to whether or not you want those people to be vaccinated or whether you will provide for a testing alternative as well. So you could treat those people just like you would any other visitors or any other people coming into your workforce. So hopefully that answered that question. But let me get into what you have to do by December 5th, and those are what you see here, there's seven things. One, develop a, a policy, um, a vaccination policy that's compliant with the ETS. Uh, we can help you in that respect if you don't have a good policy, either that one that has for mandatory vaccination or for the testing alternative. Uh, we can help you in that regard. Second, you got to collect the records. And Carrie talked about you have to determine what the employee's vaccination status is. That's a requirement to be done by December 5th. Um, you have to provide vet certain vaccine information to the employees um, that will help them to um, help the employees to um, know about what uh, vaccines are, um, what's available to them by way of vaccinations. Um, you have to provide number four. I don't know what happened to the slides. Mine kind of froze, but um, sorry about that. Um, you have to provide paid time off permit employees up to four hours of paid time off to receive the vaccination um, and allow them leave to recover for the vaccination side effects if they have any. Um, 
there, the, the employees may not have PTO available for that purpose. And if they even if they don't have PTO or accrued PTO, you have to provide extra paid leave for that um, situ situation where they have side effects and that need to recuperate. Um, we'll move to the, the last um, things that you have to do or require them to employees to, to wear face coverings in the workplace. There was a question about face shields and whether face shields would suffice. The answer is no. The definition of face coverings is set forth in the ETS and it specifically requires um, a typical double covering face uh, face mask essentially. Um, you have to require employees to have uh, positive, anyone who has a positive COVID test to notify the employer uh, when in fact they, they test positive and you have to restrict that person from working in the workplace if they have a positive COVID test. And the last thing you have to do is require, uh, you have to have postings, post the uh, information about o OSHA and the ETS and we have links to those um, those postings. So those are the seven things that have to be done. Obviously the, the testing, if you choose to go that route, will have to be put in place by January 4th. The employees have to have their second dose um, of, a, of either um, Pfizer or Moderna uh, and their first dose of, um, of Johnson & Johnson by the deadline, uh, which is the, the January 4th deadline. So with that, we're gonna turn it over to question and answers. I know we rushed through a lot of information in a one hour time period, but we wanted to at least save a little bit of time for questions. So um, we'll turn I'll it over. One, I'll answer one, Jeff, because I'm getting, uh, and I can understand this completely, violent objections to the supervisors not knowing uh, who is being vaccinated, right? Uh, several people, uh, some of my friends here on this have said, what the hell is wrong with you with that, uh, that statement, right? So I think part of it is, is reality and part of it is what the two organizations are responsible for, right? The ETS does say, listen, you need to you need to enforce this, right? Um, e, the EEOC says vaccination status is confidential information under the ADA, okay? And only people with a need to know um, have it, right? So I think some of the questions uh, that popped up have said, well, won't supervisors have a need to know if they're going to enforce it? And then also, won't it be obvious if, you know, who's vaccinated and who's not with respect to, uh, you know, who's wearing a mask? All good questions. I would say this, I would say it's unlikely, I, I think it's unlikely that this area, the confidentiality area is going to be one where you're going to get in a lot of trouble. But I still think that you should try to limit the people who have the actual records of, okay, here are all, everybody that's been vaccinated in the plant and who, who hasn't been vaccinated in the plant, right? Um, I know that your human resources department is too overstretched to have somebody policing everything, but maybe you limit it to people who are superintendents, right? Uh, or somebody who is responsible for an area and the vaccination area, as opposed to giving it to all the supervisors. And yes, you know, the fact that someone has a mask on, might that, might that give a clear indication that that person's not vaccinated? Yes, not always. There are people who are vaccinated who wear masks, and so, that's not always the case. So it's good questions. There is a little bit of an inconsistency, I understand, and we just can do our best, that's all. Yeah, I know um, several people have asked about the PowerPoint slides. The slides are available. We'll give you the link. The link's at the top of the comment section. If you click open the chat box, uh, you can access the link to the slides and uh, we'll provide that to you. And then um, in there, it also has the deadlines uh, for when you have to accomplish certain things by December 5th. John, you wanna take another question or? Well, um, I'm looking through the questions right now, unless you and Carrie have other ones that, uh, need to be addressed. I, well, yeah, I can address this one. I mean, someone said, can an employer require a staffing company to provide proof of vaccination? Um, and so I think that's a good question. I, I, I touched upon it earlier. I do think that um, you can require a staffing company that's providing uh, staffed employees to your business to um, inform you whether or not the employees have been vaccinated 
and make the same attestation or show the same proof that you would of your employees, just like you might if you were had visitors coming onto your workplace. Another question is um, whether we have to still comply with state requirements for masking. Um, in other words, do vaccinated staff still have to wear a mask? Um, and you know, the ETS said that um, while it preempted certain laws that restricted um, employers from saying that employees um, can't wear masks in the workplace and things like that, um, I do think that um, if there are separate orders that require masking, um, employers will have to follow those state orders that are that provide greater protection for employees in the workplace. I should mention this as an overall comment, everybody, and um, I'm seeing some comments on the system, which I uh, tend to ag agree with that this this is something uh, somebody like said this ETS standard is going to be a disaster. And I, and I do I, I have to sincerely say this is something that's going to be very difficult for you to handle. Right. And I think there's going to be uh, some negative publicity about it. I think in or other situations, you know, I think companies will will handle it well. I, I do have to say this though, uh, just in terms of reality. Um, number one, OSHA has gone out of its way in some of its uh, proclamations to say, listen, um, we're expecting good faith on the part of an employer here. And so I think if you do your best, I, I I, I don't see OSHA being nitpicky about technical violations um, and, and that sort of thing, right? And the other thing I'll say is that their resources are going to be tremendously stretched. So the, where, you'll, where you could potentially get in trouble is an employee whistleblower who brings something specific to OSHA's attention. I don't think they are going to have the resources to be auditing companies and looking at kind of the fine details and the technical requirements in this situation. I think that's right, John. Um, it, one of the questions that has come up is, um, you know, this this part about the attestation about employees certifying, you know, if they, if they can't produce a copy of their uh, vaccination card or other medical documentation showing that they've been vaccinated, then um, what the ETS says is that the employee can certify about their vaccination status as being true and accurate um, and being subject to criminal penalties. Now, the, the ETS doesn't go beyond that. It doesn't say, OK, well, you know, what are what criminal penalties or uh, what perjury is, is it, this isn't like somebody who who has uh, subject to the court authority for maybe held in contempt of court for for perjury. But um, but I think the intent was that you're trying to get people to, to sign something where, you know, they understand there, there may be some risk potentially of um, of falsifying the data, which could happen and, and if they falsify to their vaccination status, which which is likely to happen. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is one of the questions that came up with the related um, on the, the threshold of coverage, um, the, the issue about related companies, and I talked about how OSHA mentioned that that companies may be looked at as being integrated if they handle safety matters uh, collectively. And, and so the question was, well, what does that really mean? And from my perspective, it means things like, you know, do they have an integrated safety director? Uh, is there a common safety office that's responsible for handling your safety issues? Um, are COVID-19 policies developed for one entity maybe the parent entity and circulated and used by the related entities. Um, I think those kinds of factors are going to be considered again on a case by case basis to determine whether or not the company should be um, considered as one company for purposes of, of threshold coverage issues. Um, I know we're over an hour now and it's it's past uh, one o'clock Eastern time. And so um, I'm happy to stay on John. I, I don't know if you've got, um, you know, for a few more minutes, but um, I know we're not going to get to all the other questions. So maybe we'll take two or three more. And I know Carrie has to go. I, for I'm going to drop off, but thank you everybody for attending. OK, thank you, Carrie. So so Jeff, I say we maybe take a couple of more um, questions. I see a couple and I'll I'll respond. And obviously, you know, we're here for our clients. So, you know, we're in constant contact with a lot of you and we can provide more information in that way. 
Um, somebody asked about the religious accommodation, you know, how far are we willing to, or how much can we ask for? And I think it's a good question in that I think before COVID and before these unique times, my advice to clients would be if somebody comes to you with a religious belief that you, for the most part, unless it's something obviously um, you're not credible or something which really kind of raises your suspicion that you accept the sincerity of somebody's religious belief. I, I, I do think the desperate times call for desperate measures. And, and I think in certain areas, you're going to get people doing kind of copycat things. I mean, they're going to be so resistant to either the vaccine or the testing that you're going to get a lot. And so you can ask, I, you, you can go deeper, I think, in this situation. And there's always some risk, right? But I think you can ask, okay, you know, what's the basis of your religious belief? You know, uh, is it, you know, did the person, have they had vaccines before, for example, right? Um, you know, have they acted inconsistently with what they're saying is their religious belief? Does it seem like they copy and pasted something off the internet in a way that, detracts from the credibility of their of, of what they're saying, right? It's really hard to challenge sincerity of religious beliefs, but depending upon your risk tolerance, this may be a situation where I don't think the courts or even the EEOC is going to, um, um, you know, be too demanding with respect to allowing employers to ask questions and even eliminate people uh, from an accommodation because they come to the conclusion that the religious belief is not sincere. Again, you have to be really careful. We've got forms that'll help, but but I think there are going to be situations where you're just going to have to say, listen, um, this is incredible and this is inconsistent with what you've done in the past and I'm not granting the accommodation. So John, one of the questions that came up was, um, how do you handle testing situations for employees where they're working most of the time they're working remotely, but then they come into the office sporadically. Um, and fortunately, the ETS actually addresses that specific point in the regulations um, under um, 1910.501, um, it would be uh, 1G little 2. Um, it basically says that if where an employee has been out for more than seven days, then um, they come into the workplace, they have to um, test they have to go get an, a COVID test before they come into the workplace and um, within seven days prior to coming in, and they have to provide that re test result to the employer upon coming into the workplace. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, John, I think maybe we should uh, wrap it up and we'll um, try to answer the questions. Um, you know, we have uh, the chat log and we'll try to reach out um, and address these individually, I guess, uh, in written form. I agree, Jeff. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Again, we're thrilled with the attendance at this presentation, and we know that all of you are dealing with very, very difficult issues. And again, we're, we're here to help uh, with it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.